Okay, today I'm going to talk about radical expressions and roots. And really, when we look at radical expressions, it looks like this. You've probably seen it before as a square root. So you've probably seen the square root of 4 is 2. That's a radical expression. And the answer that you end up getting out is the root. But uh, let's talk for just a second about a little bit of the terminology that goes along with it. It's pretty simple stuff. You've got your radical sign. You've got your uh, the A underneath, whatever's underneath that is referred to as the radicand. And then you've got this section, which is an index. Now, I'd like to sort of view this conversation through the lens of an exponent. So if I have, you know, 3 to the third power, well, I have my base and my power, and the power tells me how many times I multiply the base times itself. So 3 to the third looks like this because I take this number and multiply it by itself this number of times and ended up with 27. That's just uh, how the exponent is set up. Well, similar to the relationship with uh, multiply and divide, so when I have basic 4 times 3 equals 12 nonsense, uh, 4 groups of 3 in each group gives me 12. Well, the reverse of that, of course, is if I have 12 things and I want to break it into 4 groups, each one has 3. The relationship between radical expression and root works in a very similar fashion. Oops. It helps to erase with an eraser. That's the major math tip for today. Um, so what I mean is, essentially, uh, I'm looking at the idea of, okay, in an exponent situation, which is basically a hyped up multiply, I'm starting with this number and I'm going to do it this many times and then okay I end up with 27. The reverse of that is starting with 27 and working my way back to get 3. Well that's what radical expressions are for so I'm going to end up with the third root of 27 is equal to 3. And the statement I'm really making is what number can I raise to the third power to get this uh, radicand. So what's the root? I can raise to this to get this. So it's just a different uh, way of looking at things. Uh, for instance, if I had the fourth root of 16, what that means is what do I have to raise to the fourth power to give me 16 once I you know, work it out? Well, it's easier to sort of think, well, what are the factors of 16? So I can just do in my head, well, 2 is one of the smaller ones, and raising it by itself 4 times is a lot, so I'm going to test it. 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 more is 8, times 2 more is 16. So that works. This is how it's all set up. And there's a few uh, little component issues that you're going to want to deal with. The first of those issues if you, is you do need to have some sort of contextual um, understanding a, a little bit of vocabulary and sort of kind of what's written down. So anytime you see this and there's nothing written here, you just assume it's the 2. So this is really uh, what's referred to as a square root. It's the one you've done the most, most likely, if you're at this point. Um, on the other side of it, if it's to the third power, this is a cube root. And really it delves into the idea of um, if I was doing something raised to the second power to get x. I mean, that's a two-dimensional um, relationship. And then if it's to the third power, it's a three-dimensional relationship, that whole thing. But you just need to know that. And also that you probably will never see the two there. If you, there's nothing there, you just assume it's a square root. That's just one of the contextual things that you have to know in order to, to do anything with it. Now let's talk about how you can tell, based on what's given to you, how many roots there are. And it really delves into the idea of multiplying a negative times a negative. You should know at this point, or you probably know, and I'm going to bore you for a second, that a negative times a negative will always give you a positive number. So this is 25. If I start mixing it up a little bit and I add another negative in, well, that gives me a negative. The result is that when you work it backwards, you kind of limit the possible options that you have to get to this number. Like I can't do an even number and get to this negative. It just doesn't happen because the even numbers would balance themselves out. Even if I added, the number would become much bigger. I have no idea what that was. That was really weird. Um, the number will be much bigger here, but you'll still end up with you know the positive answer, uh, 625. But uh,
the real point that I'm trying to make is simply that the index that you have really affects how many possible roots that you can have. And there are three options essentially. You could have zero real roots. And when I say real, I mean they're not imaginary. So you have to think back for a second. If you have the square root of negative 1, this can't exist because there's nothing that you can multiply times itself, you know, just one time by itself, so to the second power, to get a negative number. So we refer to this as being an imaginary. We're going to talk about how many real roots that you can have. So let's talk about things that have an odd number, or an even number, I'm sorry, index. So I can do to the second power, I could do to the fourth power, that whole thing. Once I know that that's an even number, there's two possible options. If my a value is positive, I know that I'm going to end up with two real roots. And the reason is no matter what, if I have a positive 2, and, or, or this is say it's a 16, I can multiply 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 and get 16. On the other side of it, I could multiply negative 2 by itself that many times and still get positive 16 because the negatives balance out. So if A is positive, I would say that I have two real roots. Not any other, in this case, I would either write it as uh, positive 2 and negative 2, or sometimes we just say that it's the absolute value of 2. So no matter which you put in originally, you can get either one back. If A, however, is negative, so your value underneath your radicand is negative, there's no real roots. Because like I just said, it's imaginary. Can't have that happen. Now in an odd numbered situation, you'll have to worry about that as much. Uh, so when I'm dealing with a third root, and say I'm raising, I'm trying to get 27 like I did before versus negative 27. Well, the difference here is that if I want positive 27, I have to do 3 times 3 times 3, so my root value is going to be positive 3. On the flip side of it, if I want negative 27, I can't start out multiplying 3 by itself. The only way I can make it happen is multiplying by a negative 3. So that would give me negative 27 because 1, 2, 3, that's an odd number. I'll get a negative answer. So as you can see, in this case, if you have an odd-numbered index, that means you're going to have one real root. You don't have any situation, fortunately, that uh, you end up with an, an imaginary number because that can't happen. A negative times a negative times a negative is going to give you the negative, whereas the positive versions will give you the positive. It's sort of convenient, but not as much. So even number, it's either two or nothing. An odd number, you're, only, you're always going to have one. So let's look at a couple and just do them, that would be easier. So in this case, I want to do the cube root of 1,000. So I, what I'm looking to do is this. Now in this case, I know that I have an odd numbered uh, index, which means that I'm going to have one root. So I need to think, well, what do I multiply by itself three times to get 1,000? Well, 10 because 10 times 10 is 100 times 10 more is 1,000. So I know also that it has to be positive 10. If I had done it by a, a negative there, it wouldn't have given me the negative 1,000 that I needed to. On the other side of this one, I want the cube root of negative 0 0.08. Oh, sorry, two O's. Now I know for a fact that since this is negative and this is an odd number, my answer is going to be negative. Then I have to start thinking about this number right here. Uh, what do I raise two to the third? Uh, what do I raise to the third power? I'm sorry, to give me eight. Well, it's two now that I've given it away. I also have to adjust a little bit for the uh, fact that it's in the eight uh, thousandths range, so it's going to end up being negative zero point two. And that would be to the third power if it ended all things. So I know that negative 0.02 is that root. Now if this had been a positive, I would put a positive here. And that's just because I have an odd number uh, root. Now let's do one to the fourth root. In this case, I'm doing 16 to the fourth. Uh, I want the fourth root of 16. We'll have to think, well, what do I have to multiply by itself four times to get 16? Which means I am end up looking at the factors of 16. And I know that the answer is going to be 2. However, 
because this is positive and this is even, it could also be negative 2. So in that case, I have two real roots that exist uh, just because of the fact that it could be negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, giving me 16. So the whole thing is working out. On the other side of it, I want to know what the fourth root of negative 16 over 81 is, which is kind of a beastly question. But not really. And the question asks me, what are the real roots? Well, it's an even numbered index. It's negative, which means there's no situation I can multiply something by itself four times and get a negative number. So all I have to do is say no real roots. You could just kick it out. Incidentally enough, if it was positive, it would be 2 over 3 because 3 to the fourth power is 81. But it's not, so no real roots are possible. That's the nice uh, thing about roots is you can sort of get an idea of where it's all going, especially if you're pretty good with factoring or finding the common factors. Now, simplifying radical expressions. I always, when I'm doing the simplification, otherwise I never do it, but I tend to put a 2 here. And what I want to think about really, instead of thinking, okay, well, what to, what do I raise to the second power to get x to the fourth, I start looking at this individually in pieces and turn, think of this as a fraction. Like I said in the beginning, thinking of it as a fraction is easier. So if I just do this, now I could do the square root here or raise it to the one half power, but the big issue is here. Now, uh, the nice thing uh, about how this is all sort of set up is I know the square root of 81 is 9. The cool thing about this is I know that when I do an exponential, uh, like an exponent raised to a power, I need to do one less operation than I would do with the coefficient here, so I would multiply them together. So I'm really doing 4 times 1 half or 4 over 2, which is just 2. So that means this becomes x to the second power. And that's it. If I were to have um, a remainder, so say this was 5 to the 1 half power, then I would have to do a little bit of a split where I don't keep everything sort of inside that setup. I have, uh, let's just do 81 x to the fifth. And I'm going to raise that to the fourth power. So I'll do it really badly drawn in the corner <laughs> over here. And this is to the second power. Well, the square root of the 81 thing would stay the same. But if I do x to the fifth times 1 half, or raised to the 1 half power, so 5 times 1 half gives you x is 5 over 2, which gives you 2 and 1 half. How we handle that situation is the real issue here. In this case, the square root of 81 is just 9, so it actually stays outside of the radical sign. If you have this remainder, you actually have to leave it on the exponent underneath the radical sign. So this x to the second power part actually comes out because it worked out. I mean, it sort of pulled itself out of the mud and made it out. So it's still going to have that x squared there. The problem is, inside that radical sign, you're still going to have the little fraction left over. So it's x to the first power inside. So you'd end up with this. But that doesn't only happens in that situation. Now, from here, so I'm going to leave the answer as 9x to the second power. In this case, I'm raising it to the, or I'm trying to find the, the cube root or the third root. So I'm going to do 8 to the 12th raised to the 1 third. And then separately, I'll do b to the 9th raised to the 1 third. Well, 12 times 1 third is 12 over 3. 12 divided by 3 is 4. So I know a to the 4th power. b to the 9th raised to the one-third power, I get 9 times one-third, or nine-thirds, or three. So I could say b to the third power. It's really not that complicated to do. And in the last one that I have down here, all I need to think about is, okay, it's uh, fourth root, so I'm going to do x to the eighth times one-fourth, and y to the twelfth times one-fourth. So I end up with 8 times 1 fourth, or 8 over 4, or 2. So it becomes x to the second power. And then here, I end up doing basically 12 divided by 4, which is 3. So I get y to the third. So that would be it, basically, except 
I have to go and think back to the idea of, okay, how many real roots are there? In this case, there's only one, so I'm good. This answer is finished. On the other hand, to get 81, if I'm multiplying it something by itself, I could choose 9 or negative 9. The same thing with x squared. If I wanted x squared, I mean, you could do negative x squared times negative x squared, and you'd still get 1x to the fourth power. So um, I need to make sure that I address that. So what I'm going to do is use absolute value symbols. And once again, it's to the fourth, so I need to do absolute value symbols. If it had been negative inside, I would just say that you know there really isn't any sort of simplification that can be done unless I want to convert it into an imaginary number. So that's it, uh, simplifying radical expressions, not like this overly complicated thing that can't be done, but uh, you know, it's a start.